slides. That's perfect. Good morning. Um, Candid, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, thank you all for being here and listening to me for 30 minutes. Uh, we'll have 50 minutes of Q&A afterwards. Um, I'm going to continue with what has been brought up this morning, a model. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a model of thinking about cybersecurity, much bigger, probably much more historical than you're used to. I'm going to talk about pirates, privateers, and mercantile companies, and what they can tell us for understanding cybersecurity. Um, I'm Florian Egloff. I'm the um, head of cyber at the uh, Swiss Federal Department of Defense, Civil Protection and Sport. Uh, I work at the General Secretariat. We're in charge of all things cyber in political strategic um, direction of cybersecurity at the department. Um, so if you, uh, we're still recruiting, so want to join us, uh, you know, want to join a, a public mission, also not just our department, but the federal government in general, we're looking for cybersecurity expertise. Uh, if you're interested in that, that's the link. Um, and also come and talk to me afterwards if you're interested. Um, that's all the commercials I'm going to do uh, for the department. Now, something I wanted to say about context. Uh, who has been at B-Sides 2018? B-Sides Zurich. Yeah, some of you. Okay. So at B Sides 2018, I gave a little primer of this project. I gave you a little bit of a hint of where it might be going. Uh, this is the final result. Um, now, the obvious disclaimer, uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, the views expressed in the following presentations are those of myself and not, do not reflect the official policy and, or position of the Swiss government. Uh, with that, uh, and without further ado, I'm going to launch into what I did. And now the, the project I presented to you in 2018 has resulted in a book. And so I've, I've made up my mind of where we are. And today I'm going to present to you the framework that the book is really about, the framework, framework for thinking about cybersecurity in historical sense. Um, the germination of this idea probably goes way back in InfoSec. Uh, you might know Mike Tanji wrote about this in 2006. Um, Holger Flake gave a keynote speech in 2012. Um, so there are, there are various people that have thought about cybersecurity and privateering, pirates. Um, I've done this in depth. I've done it for five years. Um, it's resulted in a PhD at the University of Oxford. And so like this is the type of project uh, that is based in sort of historical analysis in depth. I'm going to give you a bit of a historical background, an introduction to these characters, then we're going to apply it to cybersecurity, and then I'm going to offer you some thoughts on semi-state actors, public attribution, and how it ties in with contemporary statecraft. Um, and also there, like I want to leave some time for Q&A so you can ask your questions. Uh, how does the Swiss think about the world seas? Um, obviously, we're a landlocked country, so we don't have access, we don't have a maritime tradition. Um, but for me, it was very much thinking about these informal ways that states, corporations, and people that wanted to seek a thrill, thrived on their talents, um, cooperate, they collaborate, and then competed on the high seas that characterized very well the infosex scene um, maybe a, a few decades back, uh, where it germinated out of interest, exploration, uh, it germinated in, in very much a private endeavor, not a state endeavor. Um, and so for me, this uh, initial analogy to this space led me to uh, go deeper into the history um, of maritime security. Now, uh, to understand a little bit how the world was organized in the 15th and 16th century, um, I'm going to give you some characterization of it. It's obviously bro brush. Um, in the 15th century, uh, Spain and Portugal divided up the world, the maritime world, into spheres that they controlled. They said they have dominion over it, they have sovereignty over it. Um, uh, when the Spanish and the Portuguese crown merged in the 16th century, um, they, you had this claim of like the whole ocean should belong uh, to this power. Obviously, other powers did not agree with that, and the European powers in this case um, the English, the Dutch, the French, uh, they all wanted to challenge that claim. And they said, well, actually, you can't really do that. You can't protect the high seas yourselves. You can't enforce it. And so they launched into various types of arrangements with various types of characters to try to um, gain access and um, sort of influence this space. And one feature that they used were privateers. Now, what are privateers? 
I'm going to give you a definition. Uh, privateers are privately owned vessels that operated against the enemy uh, with a license or commission of the government in times of war. What you often hear here are letters of mark that are given out to private outfits, private crews um, that then um, take this letter of mark and say, um, it says, oh, you are allowed to attack a French ship, for example, an English letter of mark. Um, and you're allowed to do that in a certain space, maybe not in the English Channel, but further abroad. Um, that's a tool of warfare. Now, what kind of opportunities and risks come with those tools? Um, on the opportunities front, um, it offered a form of private protection. So you're able to hire some privateers that are actually protecting your ships. Um, that was super important, especially when you go through difficult territory uh, where you have lots of pirates. Um, you have to have some form of protection. Note, in the 16th century, you do not have yet large navies that can protect you. It's also a source of income, a source of income for the state. Um, in the 16th and 17th century, states in Europe are still fledgling. They're like, the claim on authority over land and people is still weak, and they needed money, and access to money um, was, privateering was one way to have access to money because they got a share of the profits uh, that were made through capturing ships. Um, and it augments your national strengths. So... Um, if you want to have influence, if you're, for example, England, and you want to have influence in this space, uh, you need to have some way of generating force, of generating um, access to the space. And if, you're not, if you do not have the means to build a large royal navy, um, doing that over a private capacity um, is definitely something that is worthwhile doing. On the risk side is you enhance this competition for skills. So obviously being part of a privateer a privateering outfit was a lot more lucrative. Uh, you were profit oriented. You had, uh, uh, the crew actually got a share of the profits. Um, that wasn't the case, uh, with the Royal Navy. Um, and they're, and they're hard to control from a state perspective. That's a problem, right? So like if you send out a privateer and you say, okay, you're going to go, um, to like half the world, you traveled half of half the world, and you're going to do something there. Well, it's very hard for the state to actually make sure that that is the only thing that is being done. Um, they're also unreliable. So like when you then commission them, it's unclear that they're actually going to do what you commissioned them to do. Um, they don't have to. That's the sort of opportunities and risks. On the piracy side, you have a similar type of setup, but slightly different. Uh, why are pirates useful? Uh, pirates can be useful because they can affect a significant share of the trade. So if you want, as a state, to pay off some pirates to attack certain types of, um, certain types of other um, nations, then this is a way to do it. You yeah, effectively impose a tax on all of commerce. Um, there are also some, some interlopers. Now, what are interlopers? There's some way that companies can claim that some things are piratical in nature and are able to monopolize the space. Um, that's one way that was being done was in the Mediterranean when the East India Company in the 17th century claimed um, authority over seaways, over certain seaways. They said, well, everybody who doesn't have a pass from us um, is going to be a pirate and is therefore uh, being able to be pursued with force. Um, and then I say to paying off the pirates, that's something that is, could, can be useful. On the risk side is you have selective enforcement. So if you're going to tolerate piracy in parts of your territory, say on an island, for example, um, and you do not actually enforce uh, your law against piracy, um, you're going to have some kind of endemic structure of um, what we would today call corruption, what at the time was like side payments, different forms of authority. Um, you have an interaction with your own companies. So your own companies uh, will be exposed to um, retribution by those that suffer from piracy. Obviously, at the time, um, the, um, if you are a nation that invests in piracy as a, as a way of um, exerting control or exerting influence, um, the other nations are going to say, well, we're going to retaliate not against the pirates, we're going to retaliate against the company that's doing business here. Um, there's some similarity to how that's done today. Um, and then you have this distinction between privateering and piracy that gets blurred. The more you use piracy as a means of influence, the more this distinction between privateering and piracy gets blurred, um, and that comes with consequences associated. And I would um, suggest that we see some similarities to some parts of cybercrime today. Maybe a historical outlook, uh, just a little anecdote. Uh, in the 17th century, late 17th century, India was controlled by the uh, Mughal Aurangzeb, 
Um, and there were various European colonial settlements. You had the French, the Dutch, uh, the Danish, the Portuguese, and the English present at the, at the uh, coastlines. Uh, but the, the vast majority of the territory was controlled um, by the empire. And they were able to negotiate how the European settler, settlers would actually uh, be able to have trade at the time. At the time, the, the companies, the large companies like the East India Company that we now know as a colonial project, um, was in the 17th century still a company that was trying to gain access to markets, trying to gain access uh, to resources, and used, of course, force also to do so. Now, why do I tell you that? Well, at the time, there was a, a funny interaction, or I thought was historically funny, in the sense that um, the, the Mughal didn't like that some pirates were uh, attacking his ships. And um, some of these pirates were speaking English. Now, some of the other nations, not England, but the other nations, used that uh, predicament to send all the English-speaking pirates they capture to the Mughal to recreate an, a picture, an image, that it's an English problem. Um, that resulted in a, in a crackdown against the English East India Company, where they had to close down shop, um, they had to pro offer protection to the Mughal ships, and there was lots of like interaction like that. Um, that is something that we see today with companies that are trying to gain access to markets, that some of the uh, conditions are imposed on them, and the way that they interact with other companies, well, we see that uh, today as well. Now, what are similarities and differences of cybersecurity? Let's bring this to today. Um, some general similarities and differences. First, um, we have large distributed private capabilities and the lack of public capability to protect. Um, I think that's self-explanatory. I don't really have to tell you that the biggest capabilities lie in private hands um, in most countries. Uh, not all, but most. Um, and the skills for deploying force also rest in semi-state hands. So you have like lots of contractor relationships, sometimes informal contractor relationships, sometimes you also have very large companies that are able to shape what is possible um, in this space and what is not. Think about um, the very large technology companies that very much control much that is going on for many citizens today in the cyber area. Um, the attack surface is really large, both in trade and cyber. And the dependence of the actors over time rises. So whilst international uh, trade um, was small at the beginning of the 16th century, it rose over a period of 250 years um, so to such an extent that it became really, really important, not only to companies, but also to states. And that changes the way the incentive structure um, of how you act in this space. And then you have attribution problems. Um, yeah, you had attribution problems historically, and you have them today. Historically, um, obviously, when you capture um, a pirate that claims to be a privateer, and you're in the East Indies, and they have like a, a sheet of paper that say, "Yes, I'm a legitimate privateer." A good luck authenticating that, right? Like that's it's going to be really hard. Uh, you're going to have a crew that speaks maybe 12 languages. Um, there's like a multinational crew, and they have different types of privateering. Um, letters that they have, like a letter, letters of mark, um, good luck authenticating that. So like there's, there's a lot of like difficulty also on the seas. What are the differences? Well, on the different side, we have obviously a fast moving technological innovation and rapid diffusion of information and knowledge. That's much faster today than it was back then. Then there's an important element of physicality and distance. While I don't deny that there are close access operations in cyber, um, there are differences in terms of like how you have to expose yourself when you're a pirate and you want to capture a ship. Um, that's very different um, from most of the operations we see in, cyber, in, in cyberspace. Um, then we have a depth of international institutions. We have the UN, we have international law that sort of changes some of the characteristics of what states are able to do without um, using legitimacy. Um, and you, importantly, there's a transformation of the domain characteristics possible. So we could theoretically rebuild the way um, networks work, right? We can enhance security over time. It's a long-term project, but you are able to transform how you're able to interact in this space. Um, in On the seas, limited possibility of that. Yes, there are some canals that are being built, maybe one or two every century, but like it doesn't happen that often. And so let's go a bit more in depth on these actors. Uh, I talked about pirates. Um, what is the analogy to 
um, cybersecurity. Well, some part of cybercrime very much resembles piracy. So um, there's some endemic structure in some societies. Some cybercrime is so deeply within the structure of the society, it's tolerated as a means of generating income, um, that you have a long-term challenge of getting rid of it. So there's like some political economic tie-in between the two phenomena. Um, but that's not what my main focus is. My main focus is on semi-state actors. It's on those actors that have special relationships to states. And not all states, but to some states. Um, and those are the privateers and the mercantile companies. Um, on the privateering front, uh, we have patriotic hackers. Um, we saw them as an element uh, first in 2007 um, in Estonia, where, where you saw like some of the Russian elements being mobilized as patriotic hackers. Um, to what degree they are actually patriotic hackers that are unorganized or not, That's, there's some debate around that. But you see similar elements going on today if you think about the um, Ukrainian war or the, the war in Ukraine um, and how both sides try to mobilize some capacities um, to fight on their own behalf. Um, you see some of that going on. You also see some cyber criminal elements um, being tasked and used by states. Um, I would refer back to um, a presentation that Michael Sandy, Tillman Werner and Elliot Peterson gave at Black Hat 2015 uh, where they demonstrated and showed that um, the SUS uh, Trojan was used um, to have like some intel collection function uh, for an undisclosed state. So like there's some element of like access as a service or also information collection that can be seen to be tossed in cybercrime. Um, what about, um, I have an example um, of how, what that looks like on the political level, on the grand political level. Um, I brought a quote with me from Vladimir Putin, from President Vladimir Putin, um, from 2017 when he was asked about the um, intervention in, uh, in the American elections of 2016. Um, he was asked, well, well, were there really, you know, Russians involved? And no matter whether they were involved or not, which um, we, can, we can debate, I you know, like I have some sources on here that are pretty strong on that. Um, but what he said is, he said, hackers are free-spirited people, like artists. If they are in a good mood in the morning, they wake up and paint. It is the same for hackers. They wake up today, they read that something is happening in, in interstate relations. And if they are patriotically minded, they start making their contributions, which are right from their point of view, uh, to the fight against those who say bad things about Russia. Is that possible? Theoretically, it's possible. Now, note this is a president of a country saying it. That's different from me reading a quote, right? There's a president of a country saying this is the answer to a question of, like, Russian involvement um, in the 2016 elections. Um, if this is the answer, that's a political message, right? The political message is clear. Political message is, um, by the way, everybody who engages in Russian interests, you have top-level political cover. Um, we're not going to prosecute you because you're like artists, right? Uh, you get up in the morning, and if you feel so like it, then you're going to be uh, doing things in our interests. Um, that's what political cover looks like. Um, we see that in the various other uh, connotations or in, in other spaces as well. But I just wanted to give you a flavor of like how the politics interact with what's actually going on in the, in the network space. So let's go to mercantile companies. What am I talking about here? Well, if you look at the uh, worldwide... Uh, biggest companies by market cap. And this is a little bit of a dated slide. It's from 2020. Um, but it looks roughly similar today, as, except from the rebranding of Facebook to Meta. Um, you see Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, uh, Meta now, Alibaba, Tencent, and uh, today also TSMC that will be in the largest companies of the world. Um, the size is enormous. If you think about the size of this, these companies, um, like the footprint that they have, is bigger than some of the states that exist on this planet. And you see that also in the sophistication of the operation that they take, right, to interact with states. Um, and for me, like, that resembles the type of mercantile companies that we saw back in the 17th century that really tried to build up embassies, tried to build relations with states, sometimes also being competitive behaviors with states, where they said, well, what state X does is illegitimate. We don't want that. And they actually compete on the level of international politics and engage on the level of international politics with a quality that we don't see from normal companies. It's a different caliber. It's a different flavor, um, a different type of actor um, that we're dealing with. Um, and that has consequences for how 
Cybersecurity is provided by whom, for whom, through what, what responsibilities come with that. That's part of the conversation that was alluded to from uh, the previous speaker. Obviously, we also have state actors. Um, we have navies um, on the one front. We have navies that grow over time and get more formalized and have more dedicated, clear, specific capabilities, have more rules of engagement, those sorts of things. Uh, similar in cyber, we have uh, cyber commands, we have intelligence agencies, we have police forces, there's lots of contracting relationships. So, like, there is state capability being built worldwide. Um, but I would pos pose to you that that state capability if you exclude some of the top big ones, um, it's still nascent. It's still, like, states are still late to the game here. Um, if you compare to the sophistication and um, scope of operations that you have uh, in a large company, um, the type of, uh, the, the way that states engage here is still relatively small. That would be my, my thesis here. And feel free to challenge me on this uh, in the Q&A. Um, so what's the, what's the overall picture? I said I'm going to give you this model, and I've given you now the thinking model of these different type of actors and how they interact with one another. Now, obviously, I don't want to leave you hanging on like where we are in this space. And I would say, well, one thing that was really important on the, on the, in the naval space was this distinction between piracy and privateering. Um, until this distinction was able to be made, so as long as it stayed blurred, um, things like prosecuting piracy remained really, really difficult. And we had to have some incentive structure that more countries started to see, also companies, that this blurring of this distinction was not in their strategic interest. Um, I brought you the example of England uh, in the late 17th century. You see an, a move from the extensive use of privateers um, and pirates to limiting those privateers, actively fighting piracy. And this transformation was not just economic and political, it was also legal and social. They had to rebuild the structures of their empire to make sure that those payments that were made, the side payments I was talking about in privateering, and the side payments of like how piracy is endemic in societies, that had to be changed, right? That was an active process of change. Um, and um, why was that, right? It was because the um, interest in stability rose over time. Um, to, where are we today? Well, cyber criminals are not extradited, some of them. Um, the legitimacy to prosecute each other's nationals um, is not acknowledged by everyone worldwide. Um, some states are making extensive use of these digital privateers and pirates. Um, and in my view, the economic situation is actually shifting towards more mercantilist policies. So policies where politics and business over overlap. Um, and this abolishes one of the main sources for stability, um, namely international trade that doesn't like this predatory practice. And the more we go into this mercantilist type of policies where you have realms, different realms of trade, um, the more you're actually solidifying this difficult problem um, of politically supported uh, blurred spaces. Uh, public attribution can be one lens um, to look at how states think about this political and legal ordering process. So in public attribution statements, states will explain to you um, why they think certain things, certain types of actions are illegitimate or um, are not strategically um, acceptable in their, in their um, own view. And um, I would just, just, just suggest to you that that is one of the ways that you can measure of where we are in this process. Uh, with that, I come to some conclusions. Um, uh, I've argued that the actors present in cybersecurity with regard to the proximity to the state, so the sort of the semi-state actors, uh, resemble to actors that were present in naval warfare in the 16th and 17th century. Um, the militarization of this space resembles the situation in the 16th century when some states transition from relying on privateers to professional navies. So you have this growth of state capability and this transition incentives start to rise. You see the competition for skills, those sorts of things. All the problems that were present in late 16th century um, naval recruiting are also pr present today in recruiting for states. Hence my slide about, uh, you know, do join the federal government if you're interested. Um, the regime of against privateering took a long time to form. This was a 150 years process. Um, and ca it can be traced back to these unintended consequences of state-sponsored and state-tolerated non-state violence. Uh, so this blurring of these spaces creates problems sometimes. Um, and, and getting rid of that blurring is really hard. Um, and so like that's 
that takes a long time to, to change policy, even if you, if you wanted to. Um, in cybersecurity, um, I think we can expect these unintended consequences to increase over time and also open up opportunities for this differentiation to, to come about. So to have more clarity on like what actual cybercrime we don't want and what actual type of independent hacking we don't want uh, as a global community. Um, and then to, lastly, the mercantile companies, uh, they were in cooperation and conflict with states, operated their own foreign policy and had a tendency to monopolize. Uh, they wanted to control, right? Um, at first, there was a predatory, predatory phase where you want to expand, and then you want to solidify and control. Um, and in that control phase, you actually want cooperation with governments that stabilize your space. Um, today, we see analogs um, that are stabilizing and destabilizing. I talked about the destabilizing elements before. If you're interested in that type of argument, uh, if you're interested to go deeper, um, I wrote a book about it. It's available in July. Um, feel free to also ask me afterwards. If you don't want to read the book, uh, just ask me. Uh, and with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Yeah.